All right, hi guys. Uh, coming at you from Spartan Race Canada. Today I am speaking with Amanda Doe, who is a Spartan Canada Pro Team member. Uh, we're lucky to have her on the team. Unfortunately, our 2020 race season didn't go as planned due to COVID-19, but uh, nonetheless, a valuable member of our Spartan Pro, Pro Team. Uh, Amanda had, in 2019, a few highlights. Uh, placed six in the Spartan World Championships. She also was the first Canadian uh, to win the OCR World Championships 3K and 15K race distances. And uh, just in 2019 had 10 first place uh, finishes uh, in the world of OCR, which is, is quite impressive. Um, and then on the side, Amanda is also a wildland firefighter, which we will talk about a bit later in our one-on-one. -on -one. So Amanda, thank you for taking the time to talk with me from Spartan Race Canada and the yes. whole entire community. Welcome. Hi. <laughs> well, thank you. Good to be here. <laughs> yeah, nice to have you. Um, so I guess to kickstart the conversation, um, I'm curious and I'm sure a bunch of the community is curious of how did you even find out about the world of OCR? Like what was the you know what who was it that told you about it what happened give us your give us your story yeah so i always did sports and athletics when i was growing up i always kind of just did any sport that was available in school and my dad did a lot of triathlons when i was growing up so i was just accompany him to triathlons i started out just you know spectating volunteering and eventually i started competing in a few of them uh, just for fun, nothing serious. You know, I would just kind of go out and be like, oh, I'm just going to do this race. I don't really know much about it. Um, and then as I got older, just kind of progressively did more. So I did a half marathon, I think when I was in junior high with my mom. And then in high school, I did a marathon with my dad. And I just kind of like started doing more and more. Um, and then I think our first obstacle course race, uh, I had just graduated high school. And my parents found this random event called Spartan Race. Uh, so this was one of the one of the first ever Spartan races. <laughs> I think it was the first event in Canada. Okay. So what what year was that? It was, what year was? It was a bit different from how they are today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so I did the event. It was in Calgary, so it was at COP, people that know Calgary or the wind sport area. Uh, so it's like a little ski hill that we have here in Calgary, and they had obstacles where you had to uh, blow up a balloon. And I couldn't even do that. Like <laughs> that was so hard. I was like, Dad, you gotta do it for me. I can't blow this balloon. <laughs> oh my um, God. I, and we definitely had stuff like barbed wire and like jumping over a fire and stuff, which was super cool. And then I remember there was these little hills, like pretty small hills, just kind of like maybe maybe I could get that far. And I could not keep up to my mom. And I just remember she was so far ahead. And I was like, Mom, you gotta wait for me. Like you're so fast. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's yeah, crazy. It was, a, it was a fun experience. <laughs> How old were you, do you think, when you did that? I was probably like 16, 17. I think I had just graduated high school, so somewhere around okay. there. Yeah. Okay. It was, a, well, it was a fun race. There. Um, and there is, at the finish line, so they used to have these gladiators at the finish line. So I remember that. Guys dressed up in, Spartan armor, and they have these, I, we call them marshmallow sticks, I don't know what the official term is, but they're like those long sticks with the, like the, I don't know, giant marshmallows at the end. And yeah. my brother decided he would try and launch through uh, these gladiators, and they both decided to like smash him with their sticks at the exact same time. So he's jumping through, one of them hits him on the top, one of them hits him on the bottom, and he just goes like, <laughs> straight and over oh, two. Man. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a good finish to the race for sure. <laughs> wow. Yeah, definitely like what Spartan was back then versus what it is now. I think it's sort of totally done a 180 um, and has become yeah. over the years more competitive and more um, uh, serious in a way, um, I guess. Um, yeah. Because yeah, like we don't yeah. have yeah, we don't have the gladiators who try and like beat you up at the end. Um, yeah, no, there's no balloon blowing up. Although I did a race and I forget where it was. I think it was in Ottawa a couple, couple of years ago and they had a frisbee toss. Yes. 
um, like an oh, like a frisbee like golf, and it was an obstacle. And you know, you finish dragging, uh, I don't know, like the the plate or something in the sand, and you're running up and down the hill. And then you get to this obstacle that's a frisbee golf toss. And I was like, my mind was so confused. I'm like, what? Like, I just did like some excruciating obstacles and lifting of heavy things, and now I'm gonna try and toss this yeah. frisbee. Like, it didn't make any sense. But uh, anyway, yeah, I, I think they've definitely standardized things more um, over the years. So, but that's really funny. So you've obviously come like a very long way from that first race. <laughs> Um, <laughs> to where you are now, what was your, like, what did you feel in that first race? Like, did you still, back then, was, was it the wall that you had to jump over to get into the starting crowd? I don't think so. I remember the fire jump being right at the start of the race, though. Oh, okay. That was the very first thing. So race. what, what were Not you feeling? Honestly, I don't really remember. I just thought it was like really crazy and cool. And I was like, oh, like we're gonna jump over fire. This is pretty wild. And then <laughs> just like crawling up the hill, doing all these random things. It was just kind of like, oh, this is, like, this is, <laughs> this is a cool thing to do. <laughs> right? Yeah, like this is a really different race. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's super fun. I don't think I did another obstacle course race for probably like three or four years after that. I didn't even really know what it was, didn't know it was a raid. I just kind of, yeah, I'd never heard about it again until one day, I think I saw a poster of it in my school or something, or online. I was like, oh, it's a fire race, I should go do one of these. Okay, so, so it, was, it what, was a while until I didn't know. What was that experience like? I guess, like, how, how, did your, how did your story go from doing that first race with your parents and your brother to then now being a pro team member of Spartan Race Canada and having raced competitively for the last few years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a pretty natural progression. So I went to university, um, just kind of did stuff at school, you know, kept casually competing in triathlons and playing volleyball and stuff like that. Um, and then I want to say it was my fourth year of university, I'm not quite sure, on the but somewhere around there, uh, I saw the poster for this race in uh, Sun Peaks, which is probably four hours away from where I was uh, going to school. So I texted my dad and I was like, hey, do you want to do this Spartan race thing? <laughs> and of course, he's always up for it. So we, we went out there. Uh, I didn't really know any more about what it was about, but it was definitely different from that first race I did. It was a lot more similar to how it is now. So it had the obstacles, so it had big monkey bars. I remember it had um, those Dip bars or the parallel bars that you had to kind of like shimmy your way across, which mm -hmm. is a surprisingly hard obstacle. Mm -hmm. um, but the main thing about that race was that it was freezing cold. Uh, it was like zero degrees. It was snowing. I'm pretty sure at the top there was definitely snow on the course. Uh, and my hands being so cold, I like, couldn't hold on to any of the obstacles. I definitely couldn't do most of the obstacles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but it was kind of like climbing up and down a mountain. And then sometimes you'd come upon some odd object you'd have to carry, like a heavy bucket or miscellaneous things. Yeah, it was just kind of a crazy experience. And even that year, it didn't really register to me like what it was or that it could be anything in the future. It was just kind of a fun thing with my dad. And then I'm trying to think how the timeline went. It may have been a couple of years later, we went back to that event and we kind of wanted redemption on the course because we remembered how hard it was and we wanted to see better, a little bit more experience. I don't know if we had done many more races, um, but we kind of knew what it was and the obstacles, the temperature and stuff, so we were more prepared. So we went back uh, and decided to run separately. So before we would always run together and kind of keep each other company and like pace off each other. And this was the first race where I actually just like went by myself and was like, oh, well, let's see how fast I can go. Like, I don't really know. I've never done it on my own. Um, so I just went for it. And so that was the year I got, I think, second in the race overall. So that was kind of the first time I'd actually podiumed in a race. I was like, nice. oh, I'm not bad at this. <laughs> <laughs> and it was the people that were there, they'll remember, we had to go like up and down 
the mountain. That was basically the course. We would just go straight down, straight up, and then we went straight back up. And we would had to like crawl up this mountain for an hour. Like I was literally hands and knees crawling up this mountain. I was like, oh wow, like this is so crazy. But I just kind of thought it was normal. I didn't know that's not what Spartan racing is normally like. Normally you can run and you're not supposed to turn your hands and knees. I was like, oh, I'm like making good ground and passing people. People are like sitting down and I'm still going, so that's a good sign. Um, so yeah, when I finished that race, I was just kind of like, oh, this is pretty sweet. Like, I guess I'm not terrible at it. It didn't really bother me that much to be crawling in my hands and knees for an hour. So yeah, like, a bit of an aptitude for this crazy kind of thing. Uh, yeah, and then from there, I kept racing more and more and more, and doing, I don't know, bigger races, I guess. Um, and I just kept doing better and training more specifically for it. And then eventually kind of like committed fully to it, to seeing how good I could actually be when I focused on it and committed to it. Um, that's, that's how we got to where we are today. Yeah, that's amazing. That's so cool. I like those first like beginning races where you're like, oh, I'm just going to do it and no big deal. And then you thought that that was pretty yeah. normal crawling on your hands and <laughs> hands and knees for an hour. Um, and it's yeah. really cool that you did it with your dad. I think that's amazing. Um, and I think that's like a true testament to Spartan Race is that you see so many people out there of all different ages, family, friends, like you know, people out there on their own, but they have just the support of the entire community that is Spartan Race, right? Um, and it's just super cool. Um, and even, you know, like the kids race and everything like that, to see kids out there and their parents supporting them or their parents racing and the kids yeah. racing, like super cool. Um, so you, so let's sort of like switch gears a little bit. You just completed OCR starts, right? Yes. So tell us about what OCR Stars is. Like, what is it? What did it entail? Um, how did it go? Yes, I can definitely do that. Just give me one second. I gotta make sure the chicken doesn't burn there. <laughs> <laughs> We'll, we'll edit that out. Um, okay, so, so our stars. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so it's this new event. I don't know if you've heard much about it, but I haven't really Hunter until Hunter you told, who, uh, told me. used to be a Spartan pro. Okay. I guess I know about it because I've been like reading all about it and listening, so I just assume everybody knows about it, but <laughs> I guess it's not really <laughs> that well known yet. <laughs> Yeah, so Hunter McIntyre decided he wanted to put on an event for people because we haven't really had the chance to race or compete or anything this year. Um, and everything just kept getting canceled, uh, put on hold. So everyone's got all this fitness and athleticism that they want to be able to, you know, put on display, test, um, and haven't really had the opportunity. And there's nothing that's been very OCR specific. So there's been, you know, virtual CrossFit competitions. There's been running races there's been a few virtual spartan races but those are very much like you go out on the trail by yourself you do all these obstacles and then you submit it afterwards uh, a little bit different style so he created this four-week event um, and it's very crossfit open-esque so you get one workout a week and then you have the week to do the workout so you can do it as many times as you want and then you submit your final score so you take a video for the gym workouts or you take your Strava segment for the run. So there's two run segments and two gym segments. So it's supposed to simulate an OCR event. Uh, it's not It's not quite the same. Obviously, it's impossible to simulate an OCR event because of the characteristics that make OCR so unique is the terrain and running in the mountains and not really knowing what kind of terrain you're going to be on and where you'll be, what the elevation will be like. And the weather conditions and will it be raining, will it be snowing, will it be 30 degrees, all those variables are kind of what make those scarce. So this is just a, like a little bit of a, it's just a little something to do to keep, to keep you motivated and have a little bit of something to train for. Yeah, for sure. Um, so it's, it's been neat, idea. so we're in the second week. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. cool. So we're in the second week right now. Uh, the first week was a one mile test, one mile of running, which uh, is terrible. <laughs> Yeah, short, short I've distances. I've never run such a short race. I think this is so hard, so much harder. I think the shortest race I've done is a 5K race, 
which feels really short, like 20 minutes, like that's not a very long race because often you'll do races that are three hours, five hours longer. Yeah. Uh, so it was very, very different. I've never really run on the track. I have no experience, you know, track running, anything like that. So having to, first of all, running on a track itself, and then being so calculated with your splits because you know exactly what your pace is every time you come around that 400 meters and you can look at your watch and you know oh i'm one second behind which in a trail race like one second you really think about it you'd be like oh i'm approximate at the pace i want to be at but with this it's like if you do not hit that exact split you can't make it up like in a mile race there's no way you can pick up that pace it's so short so it was very unique I, i've never done an event like that so it was kind of interesting uh, it was very unpleasant. You get that runner's cough immediately when you finish. Actually, you get it during the race. On your second lap, you, you're already wheezing and like, <gasps> you know, you get that <laughs> that death feeling in your throat. Yeah. So that was, that was a fun event. <laughs> so did you, you obviously, did you know about like what was to come in the four weeks? Like, did you know what the events were going to be? We didn't know until a few weeks ago. So the event wasn't released until I think September is when he kind of created the whole event. So it's been a very fast process. And then he only released the workouts a couple weeks ago. So there wasn't really time to prepare specifically. It was just kind of, you had to be generally fit. Right, Which, right. Which, you know, it's a little challenge on itself, of course. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Cause like doing a one mile uh, test run or race is like, you know, people train for that. Like that's like a standard, right? Like you need to, like, what is your mile race pace basically? Um, so yeah, I can imagine that was really intense. And then, so you did that, how did that go? Were you like happy with what, what the result was for you? Um, it went, I think as well as it could have. Um, I started incorporating speed work, thankfully a little bit, starting in, uh, I think end of August, September is when I started doing it. Um, I was actually planning on training for a 5K before those Sierra Stars was released, just, you know, as a personal goal, something to work towards. So I started to incorporate some speed work, um, trying to get those legs moving a bit faster. But I've never been a, like a super fast runner. I can hold a pretty fast pace for a longer duration of time, but that top speed is something that I've kind of been working towards in the last couple of years. So I was pretty happy with the pace I was able to hold. It was probably as fast as I could have done it without like training just for speed work because I do a lot of other stuff. Obviously it doesn't necessarily complement speed work. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think, yeah, it was definitely as well as I could have done in the, in the you know, in the fitness level that I'm at and the speed that I have, it was, yeah, I was pretty happy with it. Cool. Awesome. I mean, that's all that matters at the end of the day, right? Like you did yeah. your best and yeah. yeah, there you go. On to the next event. Um, so you, it's Thursday. So did you have some events already this week? Cause you said you're yeah, in week so two. The second workout was released this week. So it's a gym workout. Okay. So he calls it the gripper chipper. So it's a com combination of, um, farmer's carry into walking lunges. And then you do 50 toes to bar and then 25 burpee pull-ups. Uh, and if you come off the bar anytime during your toast to bar you have to do some burpee penalties nice so it's like a very condensed high speed obstacle course race <laughs> yeah um it's a, it's an interesting workout because the toes to bar are very it's a specific skill so if you've never done a toast to bar it's a very difficult movement and you can do them you know you can kind of grind them out but to do 50 in a row is a really big set <laughs> yeah I mean, like yeah. 10 in a row is awful. <laughs> yes. Usually that's the most I've ever done. So I was like, oh, 50. I have no idea how that will go. <laughs> yeah. Like a lot of grip strength, like a ton of grip strength just to hang on. And then like core and hip flexor. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a lot. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Um, so it's an interesting workout for sure. There's a lot of uh, technique involved, which mm -hmm. is, which I don't mind necessarily, but it's not, uh, it's not some people's strengths for sure. <laughs> yeah, definitely challenging, right? So that's that's cool though. Um, yeah. If anything, by the end of this competition, I will be great at toast tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that'll be like your big takeaway, right? 
and the mile run too, right? Um, cool. So you still have two more weeks to, of competition for that. Yeah. Um, Next and then we have a six mile run. And then the week after that is a uh, burpee mountain. So you do dumbbell okay. box step overs and then burpee box jump overs. And then you increase the reps every round and you just keep doing that for 16 minutes. Holy. Good luck to you. Jeez. You. <laughs> um, you'll definitely have to keep us posted on how you do at the very end. I'm assuming there's some sort of leaderboard and you get there points is. for things. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, definitely keep us posted. Good luck. We wish you all the best. That doesn't okay. sound, <laughs> that doesn't sound fun. <laughs> um, yeah, but it's, it's fun that you're, you're like, there's something that people can do, which is what you're saying. Mm -hmm. like, there's some platform that you can like, showcase your athleticism and get out there and do something with the lack of our regular race season. So yeah, totally. Yeah, I haven't actually done any virtual events this year. A lot of reasons it was kind of difficult logistically where I was working and living. Um, and then I just kind of wasn't really, it didn't seem fun to do a virtual event. Because yeah, what the fun part of like the best part about racing is being with people, you know, being at the festivals, being around all the the atmosphere and stuff. So doing one on my own just kind of seemed like didn't really seem that fun. Yeah, uh, it's been good because we have a little group here in Calgary that we're kind of have a little in-house competition with, so we're able to support each other and oh, each other on, which it is nice. It makes it better. Yeah, that's totally fun. That's awesome. Um, yeah. Cool. Well, that's super fun to know, and hopefully that may be like a thing year after year that he does. Um, so we'll see. Um, yeah. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit because we also want to sort of um, talk to like newbies to Spartan Race a little bit. So um, Spartan Race obviously offers different race distances, the Sprint, which is 5K, the Super, which is 10K, the Beast, 21K, and then we have the Ultra, which is 50, and now Trail Races. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, people can pick whatever distance they feel comfortable doing. What is your favorite distance and why? Oh, this is such a hard question. I like them for different reasons. I think my favorite distance is probably the super. Okay. Um, so like 10 to 12 K distance, because you can still go pretty much all out for that distance. It's like max effort, you're redlining basically the whole time, uh, but you have to hang on a lot longer and the obstacles are usually harder in the longer events, which I like. But I find that the sprint, now that they've standardized the events, they have the more, the more accessible obstacles, but I like to have that extra little challenge of the uh, the harder obstacles. So I, I do like the super distance. It's very hard, and you're always exhausted at the end. Um, but that's a I like that feeling. Yeah. So I feel like the super is kind of like it seems to be a common uh, favorite for a lot of pro team members um, because the sprint yeah. is so short. Um, and you're basically giving it your all and you feel like dying probably at the end. Same with the super though, like you said, like you can redline pretty much the whole, the whole race. Um, and, and what, what's your favorite obstacle in the super? Like what, what do you look forward to when you're running that distance? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I kind of like, hmm, that's tr tricky. <laughs> I almost feel like I've forgotten what the obstacles are. I've been it in so long. Oh, that's so um, sad. <laughs> but one obstacle that we don't always have that I really like is the ape hanger. And yeah. We had that obviously worlds. And then we also had it when we were in uh, Palmerton or New Jersey. I can't remember which venue we were at, um, but they have a built in ape hanger on that hill for some reason. So we got to use that. And that's a oh, cool wow. obstacle. I really like that one. But I yeah. also like walk just because they're, they seem simple and mostly like all the pros can obviously go over walls, but you can make up time on the walls for sure because your efficiency, your technique, how you attack the wall can make a big difference. Like some people will kind of walk into the wall, they'll pause before they jump, they'll pull themselves up. Whereas I just like, I run at it, jump off and then like throw myself over. And it's so satisfying when you come off the wall because you just kind of like get the like, whew, like your heart kind of goes up a little bit and then you just kind of take off. So that's yeah. fun too. Yeah, totally. And I'm glad you touched on that. Like technique's a big thing for obstacles. Um, mm -hmm. And so sort of like 
leads me into my next question for you, talking about sort of somebody new to the sport and new to racing. Um, if you had to give a completely new racer who has never attended a Spartan event and is doing their first race, like, first of all, what would be, um, I guess, uh, some words of like encouragement? And then how would you either describe the race to them so that they could be prepared for it? And what would they sort of need to know on a high level? Hmm. Hmm. I mean, I don't know if this would be an encouraging thing to say, but knowing that most people fail most of the obstacles their first time is kind of nice to know. Like I know the first time I did it, I, I failed so many obstacles. I did so many burpees. Like my chest was exhausted from doing so many burpees. Yeah. And I would say that's a pretty standard thing for people doing their first race. Like the obstacles are hard and going into an obstacle already fatigued is a very different experience. So that would definitely be something I would suggest people kind of get familiar with if they can, if they have a gym or even just a playground, like run up to the monkey bars of the playground and try hanging on because it's a very different experience. And when your heart rate's up, your muscles are fatigued, your arms don't feel the same that they normally do. That's definitely something I recommend to people who are new to the sport, just getting used to that sensation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. It's a totally different ball. Like you can do, you can practice all your things at home, but once you incorporate that cardio piece into the strength piece and combine them, totally different game. <laughs> it's a totally different game. Yeah, it's like yes. it's not even the same activity anymore. Because most people are no. like, oh yeah, I can keep bars and like I can carry this object. And then when their heart's at 180 BPM, they're like, I can't do that. <laughs> yeah, they're like, what? <laughs> no way. <laughs> Um, so yeah, no, really good advice. Um, and you know, like there's no shame in walking the course. You don't have to run it. Right. Um, totally. yeah, totally times where even in like, you know, some protein members, when you get into like the mountainous courses, um, when you're doing the up and down and up and down, like speed walking up the, up the mountain, like it's not like you have yeah, to run it. Right. Yep. Yeah, that is a real strategy. <laughs> um, yeah. Super cool. So, okay. Yeah, another big thing to do, uh, something I like to remind people, is you don't have to sprint the start of the race. Mm -hmm. Even though everybody else may be sprinting, <laughs> chances are they'll be walking by the time they get to that first hill. But if you kind of start out steady, um, you know, moderate your pace, try and get faster as you go rather than start out at back speed and then just keep down it feels a lot better to be passing people than to get past <laughs> excellent point and I think I think a lot of people do that especially first-time racers or just people who are everyone. you know Even everyone the pros do it yeah sucked in. totally right because it's the adrenaline of that start line basically right yeah. um, so I think it takes a lot of mental um, like training to pull yourself back and just say mm -hmm. That's okay, because I'm probably going to see that person, like you said, in like two kilometers, and I'll be consistently running by them, and they'll be like gassed. <laughs> um, so yes, yeah, super, super good point for sure. Um, and then my other question is, before we move on to like non-OCR things, um, yeah. how would you, like what sort of guidance would you give somebody who's looking to go from, because you have the open heat where people can just go out, do it with a group, have fun, it's not competitive, and then you have your age group, which is your competitive heat, and then you have your elite wave, which is obviously pro team members or anyone who's looking for that additional uh, level of competition. How would you guide somebody from moving from your competitive age group into elite? What would be some words of advice? So I would definitely do it. I mean, it depends what your background is. If you're not really sure how you stack up or if you don't necessarily have a running background or anything, do an open heat, what it's all about, see how it is, see how you do. Um, if you win the open heat, that's definitely a good sign and you should definitely move up to the age group and give that a go. Um, and then compete the age group, see how that is. It's different competition, it's a lot faster pace, the obstacles are sometimes different or it might be more slippery or something like there's different variables when you run in the age group category and i would definitely try that see how that is and if you 
quite well made, you feel like you're ready to go up to the next level, then definitely commit to the elite field um, because it's such a, it's a very different experience running in those fields because it's so feasible on the course. Um, so you, you are able to go faster, the obstacles have more availability. Um, and I think that, yeah, like definitely just like move up the ranks. So if you do well in the open, move up the age group. If you do well in the age group, move on up. Um, and if you don't do quite as well as you want, then review the race that you do. So if you do a race and fail a bunch of obstacles, then obviously that's what you work on. Work on that for a little while, do another race. And if you improve, then that's a sign that you can bump yourself up. Yeah. Yeah, good point for sure. I think a lot of people, you know, get sort of comfortable, like if they're winning consistently in their competitive heat or open and they're just like, well, I might not do as well though once I start stacking myself up against like pro team and elite runners and people who like are crushing those sort of heat ways. Um, so I think you're right, it's just about sort of it's okay if you don't do as well as you think, but at least you have takeaways of like where your weaknesses are and then you just try and improve and come back, right? Yeah. And I mean, it depends on what your goals are too. Not everybody wants to go become, you know, the best in the world. Mm -hmm. Like some people like being at the top of the age group category, you know, it makes them feel good. They like to get that gold medal. They want to stay on the podium and that's a totally fine place to stay. Like if you are happy there, if you think you're, yeah, like if you're improving, happy with that position that's totally fine there's no need to move up into a harder category but mm -hmm. if you do want to move up the ranks then you definitely you definitely have to challenge yourself and you won't be one of the top finishers mm -hmm. yeah really really good points i like that a lot it's okay to, to just do what you want to do and um yeah i think my question was just more for the people who are like should i do it because i'm doing really well in this age group and like making that shift right um Okay, so outside of the world of OCR, you are a wildland firefighter. What is that about? What is what do you do? And how do you like incorporate your training for OCR um, to maintain your like elite status uh, with your firefighting? Like that's a that's a lot. I feel like firefighting is good training for the OCR stuff. <laughs> it is definitely. It has some good parallels. So this was actually the first thing I did while firefighting. So. It's hard to know if uh, I'm being my elite level, <laughs> um, you know, fitness and such. But it was a very cool experience. So on that firefighting, for people that don't know, um, we're the people who fight wildfires. So if there's fires out in the mountains, um, out in farmlands, like if anything that's outside of the city limits, that would be considered um, a forest area that the wildland firefighters would attend to. So there's a lot of areas, especially more northern Alberta, where there's just kind of land and someone needs to watch over it. So that's what we do. Um, we, are, we were stationed, or I was stationed in northern Alberta for the summer. And uh, I can tell you, I did not know Alberta was that big. <laughs> really? Yeah. Where I was working was eight hours north of Calgary. And I was at the farthest point of Alberta. There was probably another three or four hours until you got to the Northwest Territories border. It was it was way up there. Wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so we, um, yeah, basically we prevent wildfires um, if there's, you know, like lightning strikes, if there's hazards, if there are places that could potentially burn close to the community. Then we kind of do hazard reduction. Um, if there's a fire, then we attend to that. Yeah, there's like a big range of things that we do. Um, unfortunately, this was record year for no wildfires in Alberta. Wow, well, that's good. <laughs> I guess. Uh, good, definitely. Um, but I wasn't super busy at work necessarily. Right. Fires. We did other stuff, but we didn't have too many fires. We had a couple lightning strikes, and then at the very end of the year, we actually had a fire down in the Calgary area, but back to where I live. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, lucky that, yeah, you didn't have a lot of wildfires considering what's happening in the U.S. and California and, mm -hmm. geez, that is just awful. Um, yeah. So very, how do you, very... like in a typical race season when you are obviously attending all the races and traveling for a uh, competition, how do you balance or juggle the two things? 
Um, so the kind of nice thing about this year was that there were no races, so I didn't have to travel. So balancing the travel with working was obviously the hardest thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it wouldn't really work with wildland firefighting because if there's a fire, you need to be there. So you're kind of always on call. Um, but previously, uh, like last year, that was just what I did full time. So it was relatively easy to balance. That was kind of like, I traveled a lot every other weekend or a few times a month, um, I would travel to the races. But being able to balance the training with the work is definitely different. So this, this year, the schedule of wildfire is very interesting. So we would work 15 days at a time and then we get six days off. Um, and that was just kind of the cycle we had for the majority of the season. But our schedule is very inconsistent. So we would find out the night before what time we were working, what time we started and what time we ended. So Sundays we would start at 10 a.m. Um, and we would go to 8 p.m. Some days we'd start at 8 a.m., go to 4 p.m. So the schedules were all over the place. So I found the hardest thing was the consistency and actually maintaining any kind of schedule. Mm -hmm. um, so I found that instead of having a set schedule of like, this is what time I'm going to work out or this is the time I'm going to go to the gym, it was more like before work is when I'll do X and then after work is when I'll do you know, a different activity. Um, and being not super, super rigid with it, but just kind of having a general plan, but definitely just maintaining the consistency of like, okay, before work, I'm gonna do something. So some days I would literally just go into the gym and like sit on a yoga mat next to my roller and maybe I would roll a little bit, but not really do anything, but just keeping the consistency really helped because I found if I went a few days without being in that pattern, then it was really hard to get back into it. And then it just feels like a really big chore to get back into it. Mm -hmm. Just having like a little bit of a schedule really helped. And I actually found too that having work, like you go to work in the middle of the day, it kind of helped to create that schedule. Like sometimes when I'm at home, if I don't have work to go to, then I kind of just put off things until, you know, it's too late. Cause you're like, oh, I have so much time. Like why would I work? Yeah, and then you're, and you're like, where did the time go? <laughs> So it was actually kind of nice having the work schedule because then it's like you only have one hour or two hours to do your workout in the morning and if you don't do it then you don't do it so you kind of just like you wake up do your workout there's not really any time to think about it you don't have time to you know, make a decision about whether or not you're doing it so yeah i'm just do it yeah but for it was, sure it was pretty nice to have um that kind of schedule and having the inconsistency inconsistency in the schedule it was uh definitely a unique challenge but I did learn this summer that something very important is that I've kind of set up my life in a way that makes it easier to do the things I want to do. So like at home, I have, like I have the gym in my house and I have a bike trainer in the garage. Um, I have only the foods that I want to eat. I don't have like extra cookies. I don't have chips in the house because if it's in the house, you're going to eat it. But then when I was living it, so they provided all the food. We, and we lived on our base. So we had like a place that we slept, we had a kitchen, we had uh, a little uh, recreation area, like a living area. And then we had a very small gym. But because I wasn't really in control of a lot of the variables, I found that much more difficult. So not being able to make the food, it was always kind of like, oh, like I really had to think about what I was eating and like kind of had to make a decision. Every meal was like, do I want to eat this today? Do I I want to eat this do i want to like make it really difficult for the chef and ask for unique food so it was always kind of a, a struggle and then there would just be all these baked goods that would sit out all day <laughs> like well of course you're gonna eat it like you're not just gonna walk for six months and not eat it like yeah. the first couple months I'm, yes like i'm strong like i'm not gonna eat that but then eventually you just kind of wander and you're like oh I'm like i'm so yeah bread. big deal <laughs> And like, it doesn't really matter if you do it once, but when it's there every day, it's kind of, you know, it adds up. And then, you know, all those things, all those different elements together uh, mm -hmm. don't go the path that you want to be on. So definitely being able to set up your life in a way that benefits you, where you have to make as few decisions as possible every day makes it so much easier. Like not having to decide what you're going to eat or deciding what your schedule is. Just like having that consistency and, you know, that's just what you do yeah i found that was like a big a big factor for sure that's a really good point and it sort of ties into my next question because because 2020 with COVID has been so 
wacky for everybody and has really thrown everybody off of their normal routine. Um, I think exactly what you just said is like super important and it was sort of going to be my next question but you answered it basically of like <laughs> how have you been coping with like COVID and you know the work and training and sort of maintaining motivation because there are no races right and there are no real Spartan competitions um, mm -hmm. but exactly what you said it's just like consistency and basically building your life around sort of the lifestyle you want and you have and yeah like minimizing your choices I guess um, to make it pretty easy so the motivation though that's definitely a tricky one um, because it's extremely hard to train without something to train for like you don't really mm -hmm. realize it because we always have races we've always had like events going on you know there's always something this is probably the first year that people have literally had nothing before like no events no so it's definitely been it's been a good time to kind of reflect and look back on things and think about like why am i doing these things like what is it about it that i enjoy like what what is the motivation for all of it um so it's definitely been a good time look back on different things mm -hmm. and then just to kind of find different ways to motivate yourself like I found this summer I ended up making I kind of had like little challenges that I set myself throughout the summer so I had I think it was in July I had this ultra run that I want to do I want to do the beautiful trail in the national park around here I um, mean I'd never had the time to do it because I was always racing always traveling for races, always training, or I was, you know, preparing for a race. And it just it didn't make sense to do a 60 kilometer run in the middle of my race season. So mm -hmm. actually having that time off was really nice to be able to do this personal challenge of mine. And then right. having that, it just gave me a little bit of direction of like, well, you know, if I'm doing this big run, I got to do some long, easy runs, different stuff like that. And then after that, I was like, oh, well, now I'm going to do this Merck challenge. So then I set up, I think I did it in, August, I want to say, um, and I kind of got my my employees to or fellow coworkers to do it with me. <laughs> nice. I may have may have tricked them into it, but then I and I had that little goal for myself of doing the Merc, so that it was and just having like that little thing there, and then it gives you something to focus on your workouts because it's like when you go to the gym, there are so many options of what you can do. You know, there's like a bajillion things you could do, and if you don't have any focus, then you don't really ever see any improvement, but if you just have that little little carrot of what you're going for, so like with Murph, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's the a mile run, a hundred pull ups, two hundred push ups, three hundred squats, and a mile run, and all the weight vest. So it's very specific um, and yeah. pretty easy to train for because you just do, you know, you do push ups, pull ups, squats, and the other thing with that is it was really easy to do anywhere. So like when I first got to work. All we have is a pull-up bar. The gym was closed. You couldn't go to playgrounds, right? Everything was closed. The playgrounds were taped off. Um, so all we had there was, you know, your body and this bar. So Murph was a perfect challenge to train for. Um, and it's super easy. You could do it anywhere. And the workout is, you know, it's a awesome workout. <laughs> yeah, for Great. sure. I, I did yeah. see, I think I've seen a couple people post on social media about the that yeah it's a um, pretty, pretty popular one yeah yeah um and so like you know you mentioned that you had like some of these sort of bucket list things that you haven't done in a regular race season because you didn't have time but say somebody like doesn't just focuses on spartan races right um you know how would you uh what advice would you give somebody if they literally are just waiting for the 2020 uh 2021 season to roll around like you know how, how do you stay motivated in that case I would say, so I assume that they have a date of a race that they kind of set their mind on. So then that does give them something to train for, which is awesome. And then you have, you know, that end goal, you have what you're training for, you probably have, you know, distance, the type of terrain, all those kind of details that will help your training. Um, but then I think going into it, knowing that there is a possibility that the race will get canceled kind of helps in your training. So obviously, brain is if it's not going to get canceled, go hard, you know, do all these things. But then at the same time, I would do my own race if the race got canceled. Like I would set up um, 
I don't know, maybe I'd go somewhere, go on a little trip or like find a little trail somewhere and do my own Spartan race that weekend if the race doesn't end up getting canceled because you've got all this fitness, you put in all that time, you put in all that work, you may as well use it. You know, maybe you can get a couple friends with you to do the, the race that you put on. Um, and then you can definitely do makeshift obstacles on your own. You know, like usually when we're training, we're able to make our own obstacles. So you can go to the playground and do your monkey bars. You can get a bucket from Home Depot and fill it with rocks, like super easy things. That's one of the cool things about Spartan is that it's, it's kind of rugged, right? So you, it's pretty easy to do on your own. So I think being able to do that as a way to celebrate your fitness, if you can't go to, go to a race, is still a really cool thing to do. And and like, obviously you don't get the whole festival experience and you know, seeing all the people, but like just being able to do it for yourself is still a really awesome thing to do. And it's still a good way to kind of like celebrate, like, wow, like I built up all this fitness and I worked on all these different things. And now here's the big hooray. And then you kind of have an end point to that because if you don't do the race, it's kind of like, you're always just like, well, I'm just, I'm just gonna keep building. Or I'm just gonna keep going. And it's nice to have those breaks where you can just kind of like celebrate and then you have, you know, you have a little bit of time off and you can still have your ice cream or whatever it is that you do after a race and have a celebration. And yeah, I think just like making sure that you do something as a, as a big finish if the race doesn't actually happen. Yeah. yeah. I think that, I think that's a great point too. It's like, you know, people would train and then yeah, you know, maybe a month out the race gets canceled and they're like, oh my God. And sort of, now what? I guess I'll just keep training hard for the next one or something. Yeah. But you're right. It's it's totally just go out there and still do something to uh, celebrate all the work you put in. And then also it's a good benchmark too to see where you're at. You know, have you trained totally. enough? You know, are there still weaknesses that you can improve upon? So yeah, super, super valid point. Um, okay, my last question. What's in the pipeline for 2021? Like what are your thoughts on you know, race season, hopefully we have one, you know, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, what's on your, your plate for 2021? Yeah, um, I haven't really thought about it too much, probably because I don't want to get my hopes up. <laughs> so obviously I'm hoping that there is a race season. If, so here, best case scenario, if there is a race season and we have, you know, the national series and the mountain series and championships all that stuff then my goal next year would be hopefully to do the series um, do the world championships um, and do all those awesome things but that could be very difficult there could be travel restrictions if we still have to oh i think i lost you for a second lost each other you lost me too? Yeah. We just blanked for a second. Are we back now? I think uh -oh. so. I'm getting the internet. Oh, it says Amanda's Thanks. network span will go slow. My network span is low. Uh oh. I can see you. Not very good. I can see you and hear you. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah. Okay, should I just keep going? Yeah, just keep going. Honestly, we'll just edit. We'll, <laughs> we'll cut go things. until it's out. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Um, but yeah, so if, if um, everything's if everything's a go, that would be great. You're, we're going to see you obviously in the national series and at all the races. Um, yeah. And and yeah. say if if it's not a go, like, do you have any more bucket list items that you sort of want to tackle? I will definitely come up with some. I can't really go that long without having a, a, a task or a goal or something. So I usually, I finish an event and I'm like, oh, like, a, oh, maybe I'll take a bit of a break. And then I get bored. I'm like, oh, you know what? I'm going to do something else now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like I'm already, I'm planning on doing a, like a little winter fat bike camping expedition on the Trans Canada Trail. So. I always cool. have kind of something, something cooking in the back of my mind. So if it doesn't happen, it'll be a bummer because it's so, so fun to see everyone and obviously be in that atmosphere. But I know I can definitely occupy my time, which mm -hmm. is nice. <laughs> yeah, no, that's awesome for sure. Yeah, and next year I probably won't have, I might not have a lot of time next year anyways, um, with kind of working on some job things. So I probably wouldn't have a lot of time to travel. So it might not 
work out too poorly if uh, if there's not a lot of travel happening next yeah. year. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're definitely hoping, like fingers crossed, that things sort of go back to normal. Um, personally, I, I miss racing a yeah, lot, definitely. just like being around people and being yeah. in that sort of community. But um, yeah, I guess we'll just wait and see. Time will tell. <laughs> um, yeah. It was super awesome speaking with you. Really <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, you as well. Nice to talk to you. Yeah, um, that was awesome. I loved all your stories. I love your how you got into the whole sport. Um, yeah, super cool. Um, so thank you for, for being a guest uh, with us at Spartan Race Canada. Um, and yeah, all the best for 2021. Uh, all the best for your OCR stars the next two weeks. Keep us posted on how that goes. Thank you. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm we'll hopefully we'll see you on the course next season. Yeah, hopefully. That'd be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm going to stop recording now. Uh...